Good morning, everyone. On behalf of EVMWD, thank you for joining today's virtual session, Our Water Sources. This session and all sessions at our Flow into Fall event will be recorded and will be posted on our website. Before we get started, EVMWD is helping to support our local business community by raffling off restaurant gift cards at the end of each session. We will randomly draw an attendee from the list at the end of the session and announce the winner, so stay tuned. I'm Caitlin Wu, Community Affairs Specialist for the Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District. Do you know where your water comes from? Let's take a virtual tour of our local watershed and learn more about our water supplies and the team who keeps the water flowing. Meet Sean Gray, Water Production Superintendent. Sean is an important part of the team who makes this all happen. We'll be starting off today's session with an eight minute video and then we will host a live Q&A with Sean. As a reminder, please click the chat button on your screen to submit questions throughout the session as you think of them. You can also raise your hand and we will unmute you when the time comes. With that, let's get started with the video segment and show the work that goes into delivering reliable water service. How are you doing today? My name is Steven Garcia with Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District. I'm with the Water Production Department and this display here is going to show the dynamics and hydraulics of the water distribution system. Where we get our water from, how we pump our water from different tanks, and uh, how our treatment plants work. So we hope you enjoy watching how the water dis distribution system works. Hello, my name is Gregory Lopez. I'm with Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District. I'm in the water production department. And right now I'm gonna go over the different sources of water that we use to uh, serve the city. So right here, we have our Canyon Lake water treatment plant that pulls directly from Canyon Lake. So once we pull it, we treat it for any, any uh, constituents and bacteria and viruses that may be in the water. And once it's done treating, it goes directly into one of our main reservoirs that will eventually get pulled from and feed the rest of the system. Another source of water that we use is groundwater that we pull from with our wells. We do not pull directly from Lake Elsinore, but we have aquifers around Lake Elsinore. Basically what they do is once, we, once the wells are running, we treat the water to make it safe. We test them for back tea samples uh, regularly. And then from there it feeds into the system and into our reservoirs. Another source that we get is our import water that we buy during high demand situations, mainly during summer when our wells isn't enough to feed the system. So as Greg went over, we have our sources of water. Now these right here are reservoirs. What a reservoir is, is a water tank that holds the supply of water that feeds neighborhoods and businesses throughout the valley. So I've pointed out and explained what the water reservoirs are, and I've pointed out the booster stations. So these booster stations here, basically what they do is they boost water, they send water from one elevation to a higher elevation. For example, this tank here, its level is about halfway. And if we turn on that booster, it's going to then push water to this tank which is a little bit higher than that tank there. And as you can see, it's filling. So if I continue to overflow the tank that booster is pulling from a different tank and I'm not taking care of the levels on the other tank, I could either overflow the one that it's pumping up to or I could drain the one that it's pulling the water from. 
Now, to stop that from happening, you got to monitor all the other tanks as well and make sure they have adequate water to move it all the way up. Okay, so these right here are our booster pumps. Our booster pumps will pump water from one tank into another tank at a higher elevation. So for example, if I push this button here, it's gonna turn this pump on and send water from this tank up to these tanks here. So why do we have tanks or reservoirs at different levels? It's to feed different residents or businesses that live all throughout the valley. So a tank at this height might supply water to those who are below that tank. And then a tank at this height will feed businesses and residents at this level. And that water is gravity fed. One question that people ask is, does the water stay in the tanks all the time? Are they always full? And they're not. That water is fluctuating daily. The reason for that is to keep the water fresh and clean and safe for the public to consume. So we've gone over our interactive display showing you how the hydraulics and dynamics of the water system work and it's just for educational purposes but out in the, in the water distribution system we have a lot more than just this. So we've got two water treatment facilities. We've got 14 active potable well sites, 52 active potable booster stations, and 70 reservoirs, active potable reservoirs, the water tanks. So we hope you've enjoyed our interactive display here. I just wanted to uh, also point out that 65% of our water is imported and 35% is local water, meaning it comes from our surface water reservoir or our groundwater wells. This here is a annual water quality report, consumer confidence report from 2019. You can pick up one of these uh, at the district office we also mail them out and they are on the website if you have any uh, questions or want to know any information about the district you can always go on the website and uh, check us out so we thank you very much and appreciate it have a great day wonderful well i hope everybody enjoyed that video at this time, we are moving into our Q&A. So as a reminder to those on the call, to submit a question, just click the chat button on your screen, or you can raise your hand to be unmuted. For desktop users, you can click the raise hand button under the participant section. And for mobile users, you'll find it under the more section at the bottom right. So for our first question, do the pumps make a lot of noise? Depending on the size, the pumps do make a lot of noise. Um, the way that the facilities are designed, though, are, is hopefully baffling most of that noise from the public. Um, a simple uh, metal wall surrounding those pumps inside of a center blocked building or some of our outdoor um, large pumps and motors have um, a, their padded curtains that are around them and they absorb the sound 
um, a lot. But if you are next to them and on site, uh, they're fairly loud, yes. Great information. And then do they take a lot of electricity? The wells and the booster stations all take an immense amount of electricity. It's probably around 80% of our cost as far as um, moving water, treating water, uh, pumping water, um, very large horsepower motors. So electricity is a big part of our use. Um, during the summer months, you might notice uh, the time of use, which is uh, Edison's way of trying to get everyone to be on the on a off peak moment. So we, uh, just like regular households, try to participate in that as much as possible. There's um, a lot of savings to be had if we can not run those large motors uh, during times of high peak, you know, 3 to 9 p.m. if we try to shut those off. And then a follow-up question from that. What happens when Edison cuts off the electricity? So when Edison cuts off the electricity, um, the municipalities are a little different than the um, regular uh, residential consumer, but there are times where um, we get close. The, um, the power grid will let us know there's an independent uh, systems operator that will let uh, municipalities know what phase they're in. And those phases as uh, for shedding power um, can get to us, yet we're one of the last phases. And if we were to lose power just through a, um, a, a non-routine power outage, we have generators that be, can be taken to those sites and we can run them off of diesel fuel. Um, when uh, Edison cuts off power due to high winds or fires is a new um, trend for Edison to not be liable for those wildfires. Um, we haven't had that happen to our district specifically yet, but whenever um, we see weather starting to shift in a, uh, you know, high winds, high heat moments, uh, we always make sure that our reservoirs are going to be topped off to where we have our day or two of storage to hopefully get past those. Great, that's reassuring. And then another question, is there any filtering from the reservoirs to the home? From the reservoirs to the home, no. So all of the filtering is going to happen if it's coming from the well, we're using uh, the earth's crust to use the filter, the, the natural filter into the aquifers. Uh, well water being pumped is going to have very small amounts of particulates and um, bacteriological um, growth. And then at our treatment facilities, there is large filters that are taking place before it enters the distribution system. So the state mandates that we follow, the groundwater rule, uh, the surface water treatment rule, those are all dictating how much turbidity, which is the way that um, we would describe uh, the particulates that are in the water. If you see muddy water, it's it's would be high in turbidity. So, um, at that point, we monitor all that filtration prior to entering the system. So sometimes um, just like the bottom of the ocean, the little ripples, little ripples and sediment will, will accumulate in pipes. So if there's a main break or a hydrant that's sheared, if water changes its natural course of direction, sometimes it shakes up things that are in the, the pipes. So um, if this ever happens, you're welcome to call in and, and we have steps to kind of elude this, but you can also have uh, personal filters at your home. Uh, some people have particulate filters. Many people have filters attached to their um, refrigerators, sometimes just even in their kitchen. So um, it's something that you can do more if you'd like, but we try to monitor all the um, filtration prior to entering the system. Great, thank you, Sean. And then another question, how does water travel through the pumps? Through the pipes? I'm assuming so. It says pumps, but I'm assuming it's pipes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, through the pumps or the pipes. Uh, through the pumps, what it's doing is, um, uh, so there's two parts to a booster station. It's uh, the pumps are actually um, 
the impellers. And if you stack impellers on top of each other, these are called stages. The more stages you have in a pump, the higher the discharge pressure and the higher that water can be pushed. Um, and that is being propelled by the motor. So the motor then pushes through each separate pump, which is the stages, and pushes it into the system. Um, if it's going through the pipes, you can imagine that process is coming from the motors, moving the impellers in the pump, and taking water from one part of the system into another section of the system. So that's where the reservoir comes into play. That reservoir is going to be the storage for that community. And as the water is pumped through the distribution system, which is your community, imagine the streets. Uh, every, every line typically has a, every street has a, a pipe going through it. We try not to go underneath houses and through backyards. So it's on the public transit areas is going to most likely be our uh, transmission lines as well. And then when the demand from the community has been completed, the reservoir will fill with water. When it fills with water, that's its storage. And we shut off the pumps at that time. And then everything is gravity fed through the system at that point. So you um, turn your faucet on, the water's coming right out of it. And it's coming out of that, that um, faucet based on the pressure of the level of that tank that is either on the hill or um, being boosted by a separate pumping system. Great, and we have a related question as well. What is the highest place where you've had to push the water? So if you've been up the Highway 74, up into El Carrizo, there is a camping ground, uh, Blue Jay, I believe is the name of it. Uh, so up past the Hot Shots, uh, there is, we have reservoirs up there that are supplying water for the firefighters and there is a uh, boys club as well up there. And then um, the second highest is still on that ridge as well. Over if you go down the south main divide into a um, community called Sky Meadows, we have a reservoir that is there also and that's pumped from the Lakeland Village Adelphi area straight up the hill into that community. So um, those Booster stations, as I was mentioning, the stages, that one would have 23 different stages of pumps to be able to push the water that high. So we'll get it there. There's a community that's needing it. It's quite a process. And then a very timely question. Due to the increase in fires, should we have more reservoirs? So we have utilized all of our storage that we have. We've had in the past uh, dual reservoirs where we've only used one. Uh, we've had uh, what we call our loop tanks, which are large, very large reservoirs. You'll see them on uh, the freeway level in, in the, the city around the lake. So the large reservoirs that you see, those are the major storage for our system. And uh, we have adequately supplied the district with the amount of reservoirs that we need. Uh, the amount of water that we can store will last um, multiple days without bringing any more into the system. So um, as far as wildfires go, we're, we have the storage that is adequate for the amount in our community right now. Great, thank you. And then one final question before we close, what are the near-term plans to upgrade piping and or pumps up the Ortega Highway development or LEAFs? Um, LEAFs, I don't have a comment on as far as what it would change with the pumping up Ortega. We have had development that has um, wanted to build in the El Carrizo area where um, as a district, they would love to have the water, but the amount of water that is needed to be up there to supply homes, um, we say that that is great, but we would like for the developer to pay for, you know, X, Y, and Z, which ends up being um, sometimes not as, you know, financially viable for them to do that. Instead of buying, uh, you know, land and building a few amount of homes on it, they're now buying uh, distribution system that is traveling miles and 
that sometimes isn't what they would like to do. But for the amount of um, people living in the area right now, we have our adequate supply, we have the reservoirs, and we have the means to, to get them water. So um, with future development, that's what we asked uh, for the engineers to, to bring in and design is, is, you know, we want a thousand more homes, there's going to need a reservoir and everything associated with that to be able to supply for those customers. Great, thank you, Sean, for that detail. And thank you all for joining us for the, today for the session. That about wraps it up. But before we adjourn the session, we are randomly selecting one attendee for a $25 gift card to a local restaurant. And today's winner is Linda Hoffman. So congratulations. Please send me a message in the chat with your name and email address to receive your gift. For all attendees on this webinar, a copy of the presentation will be posted on our website this afternoon. So we encourage those on the call to visit some of our other sessions today back in the main lobby. We also have a repository of information available in the booths of the event. Be sure to fill out our survey in the booth room to receive a free water conservation device. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks for your comments and questions.